Hello, my name is Amanda Pfeiffer and I'm an education coordinator at the Canadian Light Source. I'm happy to share with you another talk in our STEM seminar series where we're going to be taking a look at structural biology, robots, and the Canadian Light Source. I'd like to acknowledge that the CLS is in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan and is located on Treaty 6 land in the traditional territories of the Nehawak, Anishinaabe, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota nations, and the homeland of the Métis. And as educators, we respect Indigenous ways of knowing and oral traditions. And throughout our relationships, through meeting new teachers, new professionals, new classes, we are always dedicating ourselves to moving forward in the spirit of partnership, reconciliation, and collaboration. I'd also like to acknowledge that our education programs are funded in most part through the NSERT Promo Science Program. And it's because of their flexibility that we've been able to offer workshops and seminars um, like the one you're about to see. So with that, we're going to be joining in on this seminar, which was recorded during a teacher's workshop in June 2021. This workshop was hosted in part with uh, the LAMP organization, so Light Sources for Africa, Americas, Asia, Middle East, and Pacific. We're really fortunate and excited to be hosting with this organization. And we're going to be joining in on this research story that, like I said, talks about um, structural biology, robots, and how the CLS played a part. So let's tune in. All right. And um, yeah, welcome to Thursday sessions. Um, today, we're going to be getting a research talk by another Beamline scientist. And I'm actually going to pass it over to Sakazi, who's going to introduce our speaker today. Yes, thank you, Amanda, and good morning to, or good afternoon, or good evening, whatever applies to your time zone. It's so great to see you here this morning, and it's my privilege indeed to introduce our distinguished guest, um, Professor Michelle Forge. Um, he's someone that I've gotten to know quite a, quite well over the last uh, couple of years. We've worked together and various efforts to, to, to um, um, spread the whole good gospel of light sources to developing countries um, and especially in Africa. Um, so I've worked with him on that and we have a certain closeness in the sense that he is from Cameroon and my um, son-in-law is from Cameroon. And so that means my two grandchildren are Cameroonian, just as Cameroonian as they are U.S. Uh, Americans. <laughs> and since they're Cameroonian, I'm an honorary Cameroonian. So we're all from Cameroon. <laughs> so I'm very excited about this. So Michelle is, is a senior scientist at the Canadian Light Source, and he's the scientist responsible for the um, Canadian Macromolecular um, Crystallography Facilities, CMCF. Um, where he and his team assist structural biologists from Canada and indeed from around the world in using synchrotron light to study biological macromolecules. He earned a master's degree from the University of Buea in Cameroon. Um, there he researched uh, vaccine candidates for a disease called river blindness. And he later earned a doctorate in biophysics from the University of Lund in Sweden and his research focused on understanding the structure and function of proteins that are responsible for two of the most important colors in our life, namely red and green. And with that, I will turn it over to my good Cameroonian brother, uh, Michel. Take it away. Well, thank you, Sikazi. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about understanding nature's robots. And the sub subtext is importance of structural biology. So just a moment here, I get a pointer. Uh, I think that's the one. There's a pointer, okay. So you've all heard about robots, uh, but when you hear about robots, you think about stuff like this, devices, machinery that, in, that works in factories, doing repeat, repetitive tasks, or even the, the, the recent uh, Boston Dynamics dancing robots that you see on the bottom left here. But these are not the robots I'm talking about. I'm talking about these robots, molecular robots, nature's robots. Uh, these are in cells and they carry out a, a whole series of functions in, in cells. So you see they, they behave and act very similarly to the mechanical robots that you normally think about when you think about robots. 
Now, a typical adult human cell contains about 42 million of these molecules. And they do most of the work in the, in the cells. They, they carry out roles that are important for the structure and function of living things. And by trying to understand these molecules, we can understand life processes, we can understand diseases, we can understand how to predict and cure them. And the field of structural biology is the field which studies the structure and function of these molecules. And structural biology itself has been enabled by key discoveries in chemistry, biology, physics, and mathematics. So it's a really, it's a very multidisciplinary field. Starting in the 18th and 19th centuries, the, the French chemist Antoine Foucault was the first to, to uh, observe that certain substances isolated mostly from animals, but also from plants and animals, animal sources such as egg white uh, uh, serum, blood serum, and that these substances would coagulate under conditions such as acid or heat. And uh, Foucault was the first to actually recognize these molecules as part of a distinct class of biological molecules. Then uh, the, the Dutch chemist, Gerardus uh, Mulder, went on to do an elemental analysis on these substances and found that they, they all had a very similar empirical formula shown here. And he concluded that this, this because you can see from the formula, formula that it's a very large molecule, he concluded that all of these substances, which he called green stuff, were made of a single uh, primary uh, substance or primary macromolecule. And he also discovered that the green stuff was made of smaller molecules called amino acids because they contain amino components and carboxylic acid components or properties. An associate of Moda, a Swedish chemist called Jacob Bezelius, then proposed a better name, uh, protein, for these uh, uh, molecules because from the Greek, it would, it would, uh, it came from the Greek proteus, which means primary. Okay. Sorry, if you can excuse me there, my phone is it's ringing, but um, okay, I'll just go on here. So on a separate track, physics, a physicist, uh, Wilhelm Röntgen would go on to discover X-rays so it seemed at the time that the discovery of X-rays was not really related to, to, to what was happening um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the protein discoveries. But as you see later on that this was a very key discovery for what will become known as structural biology in the future. So that was in 1895. And for this work, he received the Nobel Prize in physics. Now, Moving on to the 20th century, in a meeting in Karlsbad in, in Germany, two chemists, uh, a physiologist and chemist, Franz Hofmeister and Emil Fischer, went on to describe proteins as a linkage of amino acids with amide bonds, or what Fischer called peptide bonds. And that's it's from that meeting that proteins became known as polypeptides. Now, uh, the continuation of the physics track, you have uh, Max von Laue, who in 1912 discovered that X-rays could be diffracted by crystals. And this was a, a, a remarkable discovery at the time and sent shockwaves throughout the community. And it spurred a, a series of uh, research efforts by multiple people trying to understand how this new discovery could be used. And it, actually, Walter Friedrich and Paul Knipping were the two uh, researchers working under Max von Laue, who built the first diffractometer, so to speak, and allowed uh, Laue to, to study diffraction from, from uh, charconite, uh, charcantite and, uh, and uh, sphal sphalerite. And you can see the diffraction patterns, the first diffraction patterns from 
from those crystals that were obtained by the team. Max von Laue himself got the Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1914. Unfortunately, Frederick and Nipping were not recognized in that prize because they were just working under, under Laue. I would suggest that if this were to happen today, they would be also included as co-winners of the prize. Now, as I mentioned, a whole series of people uh, started working frantically trying to understand how to make sense of what Laue had discovered. And uh, the first to make headway of this discovery was Henry Brack and Lawrence Brack, a father-son duo. They discovered that the diffraction patterns that were obtained by Laue contained information about the detailed structures of the crystals. So the, the detailed structures of the, the contents of these crystals. And they used the, what they had discovered to solve uh, the structures of several small molecules like sodium chloride. And the, the mathematical law they had they developed was is called Bragg's law, and you can see it here. And it's a law that, that governs how diffraction originates from crystals. William Bragg himself was a mathematician also, and that allowed him to use mathematical tools like Fourier analysis in, in, in this work. And their, their work was the, essentially the birth of X-ray crystallography. And X-ray crystallography is simply meaning the use of X-rays to study crystals. And for this work, they received a Nobel Prize in 1915 um, in physics. Now, while other smaller molecules were being solved by X-ray crystallography, it took a long time before uh, proteins could be studied because they were really difficult to purify and also to crystallize. It was Sumner, James Sumner, an American chemist, who first purified and crystallized the enzyme urease after nine years of trial, trying. He went on to crystallize and, and, and purify and crystallize catalase, another enzyme, and other researchers used his methods to crystallize uh, pepsin, bacteriophage, a virus, and also the tobacco mosaic virus. So for this work, they, the three of them received the 1946 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And you can imagine being able to obtain crystals of proteins meant that the, the, the methods uh, developed by Bragg for crystallography could now be applied to, to uh, stru structural biology to understand protein structure. While, while other develop, developments were happening, uh, like a cult of, uh, Nikolai Kolsov, of a, a Russian biologist who discovered that there was some uh, residual genetic information contained within proteins. Uh, Linus Pauling, an American biochemist who first predicted the secondary structure of protein of polypeptides, and also Frederick Sanger, who received the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1958 for sequencing insulin, that's determining the, the sequence of amino acids that are present within insulin. But it was Max uh, Perutz and Andrew Kendrew, uh, sorry, and John Kendrew, um, who first determined the structure of proteins using X-ray crystallography. And that was the birth of macromolecular crystallography. And they received the Nobel Prize for this endeavor in 1962. Now with the work of Perutz and Kendrew, that was the birth of macromolecular crystallography. And that accelerated the field tremendously. The next, the very next year, the structure of DNA was determined by Francis Crick and James Watson, using a photograph interestingly called Photo 51 that was taken by Rosalind Frank Franklin. And they determined the structure of DNA and that, that's the structure that they proposed from, the, from that study. And unfortunately, Rosalind Franklin died before the Nobel Prize was awarded in 1962. But uh, uh, Francis uh, James, uh, uh, Francis Crick, James Watson, and Maurice Wilkins received that Nobel Prize in philosophy, in, sorry, in physiology and, uh, and medicine. 
from that point on, there was an explosion of discoveries in structural biology, allowing us to understand how proteins work, how nucleic acids work, how changes in the structures of proteins and nucleic acids affect their functions, the mechanisms of diseases, and how to develop drugs against these diseases. And there have been 16 Nobel, Nobel Prizes since 1964, you could see scrolling by the side here. And more than 170,000 macromolecule 3D structures have been developed and determined since then. So based on that, we now understand detailed biological processes such as electron transport. You can see here, this is uh, how the proteins are transporting electrons across the cell membrane. Here, for example, is another protein that is transporting a vesicle on a fibrin filament. Here you can see DNA replication. Here's a DNA strand coming into a DNA helicase, for example, and the helicase is splitting up the DNA strand into two separate strands. And then you have a, a, a DNA polymerase that is bound on one of the strands and, and synthesizing a new strand using the, the other strand as a template while another DNA polymerase is doing something similar on another strand. So very detailed processes that go, go on in cells have now been understood using structural biology. On the bottom left, you can see ATP synthesis and that's the ATP synthase within the cell membrane and it's synthesizing ATP and rotating like a molecular machine here. So that's why these are called nature's robots. And we now understand a lot about them due to structural biology. Now, to, to be able to, to curate and, and collect all of this information, the Protein Data Bank was established in 1971 with just seven structures of proteins, seven protein structures. Today, and 2021 20, 20, 20, is the 50th anniversary of the setup of the, of the establishment of the Protein Data Bank. We now have more than 170,000 structures of macromolecules contained within the protein data bank. It's an open access data bank containing a lot of re educational resources for all levels, starting from even undergraduate to graduate levels. And you can access it using this uh, web address. And you can, you can find videos and uh, images that can be used in your classrooms to, for understanding various aspects of uh, biological uh, systems. And here showing here, for example, here are different uh, proteins that, that synthesize tRNA, uh, that link tRNAs with their amino acids. Here is uh, a structure of the ribosome that synthesizes proteins within a cell. And this is the, one of the largest structures ever of a macromolecule ever determined. Now we could look at this, the impact of structural biology on drug design. If you look at the period 2010 to 2016, there have been 210 new drugs approved by the various agencies that approve drugs, uh, such as the Food and Drug Administration. And of the 210 new drugs approved, 184 of them were based on structural biology research. And 5,913 structures deposited within the protein data bank were used for this, um, for this research. So you can see that structural biology is now the primary means by which new drugs are developed. Now you may be asking the question, what, ha what has all of this got to do with synchrotrons and beamlines? Well, let's examine in close, in close detail what Lowe's diffractometer looked like. So if you remember, Lawe was the one who first dem demonstrated that crystals could diffract X-rays. So this is a device that was built by, by Frederick. It had an X-ray source in the form of a cathode tube. It had a, a pinhole or a beam collimator where a narrow be beam of the, the X-rays could be selected from the, from the beam that was gener generated by the source. And then you had here a sample, a crystal mount position with a lens that allowed them to position the sample. And then on this lead block here, a, pho a photographic film was affixed to, uh, to collect the diffraction pattern. And this is the, the primary sequence of uh, the primary layout of, uh, 
of a diffractometer that was used in 1912 to collect diffraction patterns. This is pretty much exactly the same uh, uh, layout that is used nowadays, just a little bit more complicated and a little bit more sophisticated. You have an X-ray source in the form of a synchrotron, and then the, 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 the X-rays leaving the synchrotron go down a beam line. You have a set of beam preparation devices, and then that send the beam onto a sample. So your crystal is mounted here, and then you have a detector on which the diffraction pattern is acquired. So you have a different and, and a macromolecular crystallography beam line essentially. So that hasn't changed very much. The details has changed, but the, the general layout hasn't changed. So what are some of the advantages of using a synchrotron for, for such an activity? Synchrotrons allow us to have high flux, a highly collimated beam. So it can be focused down to really small sizes. So we can look at really small crystals. Like I mentioned that Protein crystals are really difficult to grow. So we only have small, really small crystals of proteins. And also we can tune the wavelengths of uh, protein, sorry, of um, synchrotron beams to select different uh, wavelengths to do different types of experiments. We can couple that with modern, de modern detectors that are very fast and can do 500 images a second. We have robotics, not the type of nature's robots that I talked about, but the earlier one of the mechanical robots, we can combine those as well to automate some of the processes. And we can add in software, sophisticated software and computing resources to be able to do experiments such that X-ray diffraction experiments now take seconds to minutes to complete instead of, of years as was done in the early days. So the Canadian Macromolecular Crystallography Facility uh, CMCF uh, at the CLS is one of such a facility where we have two beam lines, CMCF ID and CMCF BM, where we do uh, X-ray crystallography on macromolecules. So we take crystals of proteins, we place them on the beam line, we obtain diffract diffraction patterns, and from those diffraction patterns, we can determine 3D structures uh, of proteins. And based on that, we can understand exactly where all the atoms are pos positioned within the, the, the structures. We can understand how they function. We can understand how they, what roles they play in health and diseases. We can design drugs using those, those structures. And we can also understand agriculture and food processing uh, processes. So here's a, a layout of a CMCF ID beam line. We have an undulator source. We have a whole bunch of beam preparation devices in the middle. We have a sample mounting robot that, that mounts samples here for the beam to heat. And then we, we collect the diffraction pattern on the detector. Very similar to Lowe's diffractometer. Now, what has the impact been of structural biology on the COVID-19 pandemic, which we are currently still under? If you look at the timeline of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It was in December 2019 that the flu-like illness was first discovered in Wuhan. By January, the causative agent of this, uh, this disease was identified as SARS-CoV-2, which, which was a novel coronavirus. Now, by February 2020, the first SARS-CoV-2 protein structures were already being determined and deposited into, into the protein data bank. So you could see it took just a month for structural biology to step up to the, to the challenge and start contributing uh, structures to try to understand how the virus uh, infects cells and, and how to develop drugs against it. Now here are some of the structures. There are currently more than 500 uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 uh, protein structures in, in the PDB. Here are some examples. Uh, you have the main protease shown here with a drug candidate bound into it. You have another protease. And just, just to, to explain the main protease of the SARS-CoV virus, because the virus uh, has a single genome that generates a single polypeptide. And that polypeptide has to be cut up into smaller peptides that form the various uh, proteins that carry out the functions of the virus. And the, pro the protease that carries out this 
cutting is the main protease. So if you can imagine if you develop a drug against the main protease, it's going to be able to prevent the virus from, from developing and spreading. So that's why this, this structure is important. So on this side of the, the screen, you have the COVID-19 spike protein shown here bound to the, is the angiotensin II receptor. So this is the, the receptor in the human cell that the, the virus attaches to, to be able to gain entry into the cell. So the structure of the, the complex between the receptor and the protein, the spike protein has been developed uh, by structural biologists. So we now understand better how that, rea that interaction uh, happens and how to develop drugs to prevent that from happening. So here are some other COVID-19 structures or structures that are, are related to COVID-19. So um, many viruses that infect cells, they bring in their a, a copy of their DNA into the cell so that the DNA can then trick the cell into producing more copies of the virus. Other viruses like the RNA viruses, like co the, the coronaviruses, they, they bring in RNA directly. So they don't bother going through the DNA. So they produce RNA. And for this, they also have a protein called an RNA dependent RNA polymerase that allows the virus to generate new copies of RNA based off the RNA that was initially injected into the cell. And here is a structure of the, the, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase uh, from COVID-19 shown here bound to an RNA fragment and also a new RNA being synthesized in yellow shown here. The, so the template is a red one and the new one that is being synthesized is a blue one. So again, through structural biology, we're able to understand how all of these processes happen and also uh, that allows us to develop drugs against them. Shown here is another one. If you may have heard that the, the, the steroid hormone, the dexamethasone is being used to treat uh, patients that are critically ill from, from COVID-19. And dexamethasone binds to a receptor called a glucocorticoid receptor shown here in green. And this receptor normally binds to DNA. So normally in a normal functioning cell, you have the cortisol would bind to this receptor and then the receptor will go into the nucleus of the cell, bind to DNA and activate the production of various other molecules that uh, initiate inflammation in the cell so that the body can fight against different diseases and different uh, systems. However, in the case of COVID-19, this process is hyperactivated. So some of the symptoms that you get from COVID-19 in the when patients are uh, critically ill from COVID-19 is because of, of the uh, hyperactivation of the glucocorticoid receptor due to this uh, interaction of the cortisol and the glucocorticoid re receptor. But dexamethasone, which as you can see, looks a little bit similar to cortisol, but not exactly the same, would bind to the receptor in the same location, but it would not, it would prevent the protein from carrying out the same function because it blocks the effect of cortisol. So in that way, they can, you can use dexamethasone at the right dose to control the amount of inflammation that happens in patients of COVID-19. So here's another example of how structural biology helps us in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, uh, here are some examples of structural biology results from uh, CMCF at the Canadian Light Source. Currently, we have about 1,500 structures in the protein data bank that were determined at uh, the CLS on the CMCF beam lines. Here are some examples. We also have COVID-19 structures. Here are two of them. There's a structure of the main protease in complex with an inhibitor, which is a likely candidate for a drug. This structure was done in March 2019, sorry, in March 2020 at CMCF. Then we have also an antibody. Here's a, an antibody, human antibody that is bound to a fragment of the S protein from COVID-19. Here are some other examples we have here, uh, an antibody that prevents the transmission of malaria. 
and this antibody, uh, this structure was determined also as CMCF and another one, another antibody in complex with a, with a malaria antigen. And here, just these are just two examples. There are lots of other examples that I, I will not necessarily go, go into here. Now, as you can see, structural biology is a very important uh, field for understanding life processes and also for drug design and human health. And it's, it rests on the shoulders of giants from multiple disciplines. I, if you remember, I've touched on the contributions of, of chemists, biologists, physiologists, physicists, and mathematicians to the field of structural biology. And it remains a, a highly multidisciplinary field and it has uh, contributed a lot to our, our understanding. However, there's still a lot that remains to be, to be studied. There are lots of proteins that, whose structures are not yet known, especially the membrane proteins. There is uh, more that has to be done. And it's likely that the future of structural biology will include an integration of not just X-ray crystallography, but other emerging techniques such as cryo-electron microscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance, a small angle scattering, computational modeling, and they, as the, the techniques get more developed, we'll be able to focus on larger and larger complexes and be able to understand more and more uh, uh, processes that happen in cells to be able to understand better life processes. So that's all that I have for you today. And I hope to be able to answer your questions. Thank you. Yes, I would like to ask uh, something. Okay. Uh, what are the benefits of uh, using this method instead of um, uh, electron microscopy or um, scanning electron microscopy? This uh, in, uh, in, yes. in in imaging these uh, molecules. Molecules. Yes. Yes. That's a that's a good question. So one of the advantages of crystallography and crystallography in particular is that by X-ray crystallography, you can determine the exact location of every atom within the molecules or approximate location of every atom. So you don't do, you're not just getting structural information about the shape of the molecule. You're also getting information about the chemical properties of different positions within the molecules. So with, with, with electron microscopy, you do a mapping and you just get an image the image doesn't tell you that, okay, this part of the molecule has a positive charge or, or this part has a, is hydrophobic. It gives you a shape, right? But X-ray crystallography can tell you exactly the type of chemical properties that are, that are available on the different, you get the structure and you also get the, the chemical properties. In addition, you can also get more detailed information, right? So. Uh, Electron microscopy is limited in terms of resolution that you can get. So nowadays we have cryo-electron microscopy where we can do reconstruction and we can go down in resolution. And uh, in some cases you may be able to identify secondary structures and, and, and uh, side chains, but it's limited in the, in the size of molecules that you can study. It usually, usually applies to very large molecules. So okay, uh, it, it's complementary to, to X-ray crystallography, but uh, there is a lot more information you can get from crystallography than from those other methods. Great information. Thank you. Yeah. Question, please. Yes. Uh, it, it is possible to use uh, crystallography to synthesize a new protein that interferes with the coronavirus protein? Uh, could you repeat the last part? I didn't quite get the, the last part of your question. Sorry. Yes, it, it is possible to use crystallography to synthesize a new protein that blocks or, or break the coronavirus protein. Yes, yeah, so, okay, so actually crystallography itself uh, is not a, a synthetic tool, but it can be used to verify structures, right? So, so it's possible, so one of the, one of the the, the, the long list of Nobel Prizes that are listed there, one of the people there that received the Nobel Prize was Anne Finson, who proposed that the, the structure of a protein is related to its amino acid sequence. 
so that you can go is uniquely determined. So if you go from an amino acid sequence, that uniquely depend, determines the structure of the protein. So if you can determine, you can, you can generate, you can synthesize in your, in your lab, you can say, okay, I'm going to synthesize a new protein by combining a, the amino acid sequence. And uh, you can generate a new structure just by, by changing the amino acid sequence. And people are, people are doing such research. It's just difficult to, to, uh, to verify that the structure that you, you get at the end is what you intended at the beginning, because that, that is still, there's still a lot of research that is, research that is required to, to, to make that quite clear. But in, in principle, it would be possible in the future, for example, to synthesize a new protein that has new properties that does, is not present in the original, uh, original protein. In fact, there are proteins, there's something called site-directed mutagenesis that has been carried out in the lab where instead of synthesizing a whole new protein, they've just modified it. So they've taken a protein that exists, modified a few of the amino acids, and it has been demonstrated in the lab that it changes the, pro the properties and the function of that protein. And actually that's how a lot of the, so some people might have a mutation in a protein that, that causes cancer. And to study that, we take the, the functioning protein, we modify it to introduce that mutation. And then we, we understand in the lab how the function has changed. Then we can now understand that, oh, this is how, when the function changes, that's how cancer results, right? So it's a good, that's a good question. And that's really an active uh, branch of structural biology research that is going on right now. Thank you, Michel. Thank you very much for your You're welcome. answer. Um, Michelle, thank you for such an excellent lecture. Um, I have uh, just a simple question. Um, when I was much younger, I always heard about molecular biology. Now I hear about structural biology. Are they the same? Well, so structural biology includes molecular biology in a sense, but molecular biology is different because molecular biology is, is, uh, is focused on understanding the molecular properties of of uh, molecules that are important for biology, right? So, so I would say that structural biology is a branch of molecular biology. Hmm. Structural biology focuses on the structural aspects of those molecules, nice. but they are, they are highly interrelated. Nowadays, structural biologists are often molecular biologists as well. Do anybody, do, do, do any people call themselves molecular biologists anymore? I just never hear yes. it. Yes, they do. There, there are some molecular biologists that do not do structural biology. They are not experts in the, in the, in the technique of structural biology. So they, for example, they, they can clone, uh, they can, they can do clone DNA, they produce proteins in the lab, they purify proteins. Uh, those are molecular biologists, mm. right? So, there are still a lot of, every structural biology laboratory contain, will have molecular biologists that are experts at cloning, uh, sequencing, uh, DNA, uh, uh, fragments, RNA, and so on, producing uh, proteins. And then you will have the structural biologists that would now take the, the result of the molecular biology, uh, result, the, the output from the molecular biology, produce crystals, and then do the experiment, the structural biology experiments like X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, NMR. You may, another term that you may hear often used is biophysics. For example, my, I did my studies in biophysics and biophysics and structural biology are kind of synonymous. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions? Oh yes, I have a question. Uh, thank you for your lecture, very interesting. I, it's amazing topics. Um, when I see the picture with you put the robot and yes. then saw the macro proteins. Yes. Uh, this relation is, is very nice because I can explain uh, different aspects between this machine and the, this system. Yes. Uh, but in this sense, 
uh, how could we explain the the electron transport in this uh, macromolecular system, for example? Yes. Yeah, so so that uh, usually before you can we get to those uh, images showing detailed processes like that that involves lots of structures being developed, right? So you have uh, structural biologists, they prepare different uh, forms of those uh, molecules that transport electrons in diff at different, in different states. And they can look at the different states. For example, they have intermediates that are blocked at different steps of the reaction. So they, they, they can do a reaction and up to a certain point and then they interrupt the reaction and then do a crystal structure they get a structure and then they do another structure at a different intermediate step. And by seeing how the structure is changing between the different intermediates, they can picture out how things are changing from step to step. And that's how they can, they're able to, to develop movies like that of how things are actually changing over time. So, so it's like taking a, 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 a movie one snapshot at a time, right? And each snapshot takes Many, many hours and many months of, of effort and research in order to determine those structures. I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Michelle. Yes. Uh, other question. It is possible to synthesize a molecular that moves like a robot to catch the coronavirus? Well, that, that would be, I would say, in principle, it is, it is in, it's possible, but practically, we are not at, the, at that point yet. So, so our efforts right now in on, trying to understand how, the, how, how to stop the coronavirus, there are, there are different levels. You have how the virus attaches to the cell, that's the initial contact with the cell for infection. So that understanding that inter initial interaction of how the virus attaches to the cell, that process, that's the first step. If we can understand that, we can prevent it from attaching to the cell, then it doesn't cause infection. So we're in the we already have structures of that, we're trying to understand that. And we just have to design a drug that binds to, to prevent that interac interaction. The next step uh, is understanding how the virus produces more copies of itself within the cell. And as I showed in some of those structures, uh, we, are kind of, we, are, we are beginning to understand that through those uh, proteases and the polymerases. And if we can block those processes, then we can, even you might get infected, but the virus will not spread within you and, and will not be transmitted. So that's the second phase. The third phase is, even if you get infected, how does the disease cause the problems or the symptoms that you, that you get from the, from the virus? And that's the, the third one I showed, which was like the dexamethasone. And we're trying to understand how the, the, the pathophysiology of the disease or the, the, the symptoms arise. So those are the, the main, three main areas that people are focusing on, on now to understand how to prevent the virus. In the future, maybe there might be molecular machines that can attach to the virus and make a hole or drill through it. Uh, to, to release the, the contents like the RNA so it destroys the virus. That is, that is possible, but we are very far from, from that point uh, at, this, at this stage. Thank you very much, Michael. It, it sounds like a fiction, but it's real. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and some of this, uh, sometimes when you, when you see things like this, they sound like science fiction, right? But um, everything I showed, those, all those animations you saw, those are real things that are happening in cells. Um, it's almost unbelievable. Um, I remember the, the, the very first structure that I did, uh, like, I, like Sikazi mentioned uh, during the introduction, I was working on the, the structure of um, a protein that produces chlorophyll, uh, chromophore in chlorophyll, and also in heme, that makes, what makes plants green and also what makes blood red, right? And if it, I was the first time I saw this, this truck, the structure of this molecule on the screen, it was really exciting because I was the first person in the world to ever see that structure. And uh, it's a very exciting, um, part. it's a very fulfilling part of the research to be able to, to work on something for many years and then finally see the structure 
and see that it, how it does what it does. It's, um, it's an amazing, amazing feeling, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any final questions? Okay, if not, um, I think we can end it there. So uh, thank you, Michelle, for that presentation. It was, wow, I just, yeah, there were so many things to think about. My head was spinning. And like you said, um, you know, a lot of it seems like science fiction, but this is real life, practical, relevant applications of, of science. Yeah. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that in our second session today. Um, but and with that, so many education curricular connections all <laughs> over the place in every course, everything from from all of the science disciplines, like you said, you know, very uh, interdisciplinary, but yeah. also extending then into um, computers and social sciences and um, communications and, yeah. and, and so many. So many, thank you. Sorry to interrupt, but I had to no, throw that out there. You're welcome, yeah. <laughs> it was my pleasure okay. to be able to, to talk to you guys, yeah. Yes, and again, thank you for taking time out of your day. Can, and, I, can, uh, I, do, can I do other, other question for, my, no, sorry. Yeah, I, I can answer a question, I guess. No. I was thinking about the molecules for for artificial intelligence. What about that, uh, Michelle? The molecular, well, so oh. it's uh, right now artificial intelligence is focused on the computational um, silicon based uh, processes, right? But there has been suggestions at some point that you could make computers out of biological molecules. So it's still, a, it's, just, it's just a suggestion at this point, no one, no one has actually demonstrated a biological computer yet, but uh, people are thinking about it. So who knows, maybe in 20 years, we'll not be talking about it as a hypothesis, but um, you, you, you can imagine DNA, which is a macromolecule, is not a protein, it's another macromolecule. DNA stores so much information about our genetic material, our genetic, so much genetic information. And uh, DNA can act like a memory. And then you have uh, proteins like the ribosome. Uh, you have all of these mechanisms that translate information from DNA into proteins that carry out activities. So like in a computer, you have, you have memory where you store information and then you have processes that copy information from memory and then you have software that carries out. So there are analogies, there are lots of analogies between life processes and there are lots of things that we can learn from biological systems about how to do computation. So it's not a far-fetched suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would like to say something. Uh, yeah. When I, um, I decided to follow this seminar, I couldn't think how, um, this um, technology could help me put things in biology because I'm a biologist. So today and the first presentation about uh, imaging uh, parts of uh, roots or parts of uh, small um, uh, animals uh, could, uh, could be done. So I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to, to see another uh, something I couldn't uh, imagine of. Thank you very much for the experience. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, well, I think we will end it there. So again, uh, thank you, Michelle, and thank you everyone um, for joining in. Our second session is gonna be starting in a little over two hours. Um, so we'll see you then. Enjoy the rest of your- Thanks, Michelle. Thanks. Thanks. Talk to you later.